Hey guys, welcome back to the show and of course, thanks for tuning in. Today, we've got a special co-host, Mark Bradley. You guys probably know him as the CEO of LMN. He's going to be taking over the show and interviewing our guest today. So without wasting any more time, let's dive right into the program. All right, it's Mark Bradley here and I've got Steve Wheatcroft with me. Um, super interesting guy, you know, very entrenched in the landscape industry with uh, all kinds of exciting things happening in his landscape contracting business and his equipment supply business as well. So um, definitely want to kind of um, pick Steve's brain on many topics, but off the start, Steve, why don't you just kind of tell us a little bit about, about your companies and, and maybe even how you got started as a landscape contractor and, and how things came to be. Yeah, so uh, like everybody, uh, I guess my story, I guess some people say your story is interesting, but uh, it's just it's just my life. So I, I sometimes I just think, you know, I got up one day and started all this and how did I get here? But uh, it's been a it's been an interesting journey. So uh, so ULS Maintenance Landscaping started up in uh, 1989 as a, a project for a business uh, school course I was doing. So it was an MBA level course to write a business plan. Of course, I wrote it on the landscape industry and to build up kind of a more of a franchise based business. Um, and then that took off in, in 1989, as I, I kind of took that paper I, I wrote for university and, and, and actually took it to the field and started to perform mostly landscape fertilization and lawn mowing services. We also had a power washing division. So that kind of kicked that off. And then fast forward to 2015, um, I had, the company had grown immensely and we were getting lots of opportunities to rep equipment as well. So I fractioned off another company with uh, a fellow from Caterpillar Equipment. He worked for Finning, which is the largest cat, cat dealer actually in the world, and approached me. We started up Spectrum Equipment. So in 2015, I uh, took those relationships I had with different manufacturers of mostly snow and ice management equipment and started up. Uh, a division of Spectrum Equipment where we rented and sold uh, snow and ice management equipment. And then we also have a heavy equipment rental and sales part. So um, that's kind of the quick background on it. Um, and of course, the story between 1989 and today, you know, on the podcast with Mark Bradley, it's uh, had all kinds of wonderful uh, tales and, and adventures along the way. Well, that's amazing. And so, Steve, um, tell me about your 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 landscape company today. Um, you know what what does that look like? What kind of services and you know staff and where where are you where what, what markets do you service? Kind of tell us a little more about your company. Yeah. Well, um, right now, as it stands, uh, ULS is uh, operating in various centers. So we have our head office is actually out of uh, Calgary and uh, we also have a, another office which is like a hard facility in other words we have like vehicles and equipment and office staff there out of uh, Saskatoon Saskatchewan and then on September 30th we actually uh, just signed a deal and we'll be opening our first eastern office which will be based out of Ottawa um, so between those three centers we probably are going to have roughly around 590 employees uh and then with our subcontractor base probably closer to 800 and uh you know we service mostly uh snow and ice management contracts and then larger municipal government and large portfolio holders for landscape maintenance services uh we do still probably perform close to 10 million dollars a year in landscape construction but it's mostly just enhancements uh, we used to do a lot of work for big general contractors. Uh, you know, we re, we rebuilt the Zoo Island in Calgary when it flooded. We installed the the land of the lemurs and the new panda exhibit. We built the all that kind of stuff. But uh, the business model in in late 2018 kind of took a right hand bend, and we decided that we wanted to move away from that type of work and just concentrate on long term maintenance contracts. Interesting. So, what what made you decide to 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 do such a pivot? Well, for me, you know, it's 
and we'll get into this probably later on, but, you know, really started to look at the type of clients we were working for and the type of work we were performing. Um, and with general contractors, again, uh, this is just my opinion, but I found I'm not the best dance partner for our company. Um, a lot of issues with uh, payment terms, uh, just constantly felt like it was a very arduous process to work with them. Um, you know, when you see these big dollar contracts flashed around, they seem to be pretty uh, exciting to get. You know, when you sign a deal to do a five to $10 million project, it's a good feel as far as like the, the salesman in you. But then when you have to do the operational delivery on that scale, um, and then you're, you're getting constantly mandated and different protocols from uh, different general contractors, uh, we just found that that just wasn't the arena that we wanted to play in anymore. So we took our equipment and uh, our manpower and our expertise, and we just said we didn't want to play anymore. We, uh, we went to a different venue. Yeah, I love that. And, and, you know, that, that, that definitely speaks to your, your management style because, you know, so often companies that have been in business for as long as you have, you know, 30 years in business, a lot of people wouldn't, um, you know, make such a drastic um, change in, in what they're doing. And they just sort of keep doing things the way they've always done them because that's the way they do them. But, um, you know, really looking at the business and making a, a decision like that based around, you know, how inefficient or frustrating it might be to work in, in that particular space. Um, you know, that, that takes a lot of, a lot of honesty to, to make a, a shift that way. So, so good for you for, for doing that. I can, and, and I can appreciate. Yeah. It was, you know, it was actually, it was, uh, uh, like, yeah, it was a very, it was a scary decision when we did it. Like we sat on the board from for a long time and, you know, to walk away from these big, uh, revenue pieces was, you know, it seemed at the time like, you know, a daunting task and it felt scary. And, you know, it did send some different messaging through the company. We had to quickly address with mostly obviously the construction department. But, you know, two two years has passed and, uh, you know, it was a really favorable thing for us to do. And it put us into a more profitable area to be in. And, uh, you know, we're getting big, we're getting big contracts now and they're, more in line with what we like to do and what we like to deliver. So all in all, it was a great decision. And uh, I would imagine there'll be more to be made later on because you always have to be changing. And, and, and you know, along the, that note, because, you know, many of our listeners don't have 400 employees and, and you know, they're maybe more in the, the startup phase or, or, or maybe they just, you know, are, are maintaining a, a little smaller operation which um, you know, I think you and I would probably both agree is a is a is a very wise way to run a business as well, um, because you know bigger is not always better um, for sure. Um, in your in your mind, what would what could you share with a small contractor um, or a startup contractor along the same line? In the sense that you know, if today maybe fifty percent or sixty percent of your business represents you know, clients that are not as profitable as they should be, you know, how would they sort of implement that type of change to, to really sort of come up with a stop doing list and, and then actually stick to it? Just, you know, maybe you've got some actionable ideas there that you could share. Yeah, well, that was a great question. And one thing that, that people have to be aware of, you know, is you'll watch, uh, a documentary on somebody or you'll hear a podcast or you'll read a book. You know, I don't, I don't know how many business books there's out there, but it gets to be almost nauseating after a while reading it. Um, but you, you got to remember that, you know, my journey is my journey. And, and I went along this path and there was all these course corrections along the way. And I never attested to had it figured out. And I don't think that whether you have, you know, three employees, you know, 25 employees or 300 employees, the decisions you're making today have to be based on where you are, right? So, you know, when you're looking at being, you know, let's say a $60 million company and you say, okay, we're going to purge the client list, to, I get, you know, you still have $60 million of revenue, so you can trade out some horses. Um, if you're a smaller contractor, 
you might not be able to be as quite as uh, selective in the start because you need a certain amount of base revenue. Um, when you have a startup company, that's that's the number one thing. You have to drive revenue. A lot of companies go to business in the first you know, year to three years because they don't understand you need a certain amount of revenue to, to run the company. But I think at the, at the very basis of all this is to understand that you have to understand your numbers and you know, if, if my staff heard me say that, they would probably all have a big chuckle right now because I was the pivotal gunslinger type of business owner where, you know, it's high noon and I'm just going to go out there and pull my guns out of the out of the holsters and let bullets fly. And if uh, if I killed the, uh, you know, the minister and the store owner and my wife and myself along the way, that's just how I was going to do it on a, a high noon on a Saturday. So, you know, now looking back, uh, I wish I would have been better with the numbers. I could have maybe made some better decisions earlier. But on the other hand, I might not be where I am now because I might have thought myself into a corner in a box because at the end of the day, you've got to listen to your gut and your intuition. So, But I think for every contractor out there or business owner, no matter what size, you really have to understand you know, your, your revenue, what's driving it, your profit margins and stuff like that. And, and these are easy lessons that you can learn you know, by going on to, you know, the, the internet or reading a book. Um, but at the basis, if you can start your company that way, then at least you have some sound way to make some positive decisions as you move through your career. Yeah, I mean, that that's great advice. Like uh, at the end of the day, the, the, the final decision needs to be whether or not it's going to, going to be financially um, uh, doable for your company. And, and I think I, I definitely hear this one a lot when when kind of coaching people on, um, you know, sales and, and estimating specifically. And, you know, they're they're always concerned that if they ask for more money, uh, they might not get any work. And their fear is, you know, going out of business from not having enough work. But I think more people go out of business from having plenty of work that that doesn't make any money. And um you know, I think uh, there's so so much value in in just really understanding the difference between a good job and a bad one, and then having the confidence to to make decisions like like the one you made to to really um, change up the the direction of the company and and stay the course on the more profitable long term work than than you know taking those uh, those big uh, big dollar jobs that you know sometimes don't feed much other than, than our egos. And, and I, I know I've certainly made that mistake in my career where bigger, bigger, bigger jobs was, you know, a, a, an area of focus, but, you know, at some point you have to look and realize that the profit margin sliding along with the, with the revenue growing and that that's no fun. That's not a good place to be. Um, so uh, as a leader, like, you know, in growing a company the way you have, um, you know, there's things that you probably do that you, you don't even realize. And, you know, your gunslinger uh, um, analogy was a good one. Um, oftentimes, you know, some people just have an ability to kind of look past the risk and and see the the opportunity. And, you know, from getting to know you, I can... I can see that in, you know, every conversation I have with you that, that you can see past all of the negativity and, and see the opportunity. And, and, and my question, I guess, for you is, as a leader, how do you get people that work for you to, you know, recognize those risks and, and problems and deal with them? but also see the opportunity and see where you're going. And I get that question a lot from uh, smaller startup companies as well, where they're, you know, maybe in year three, four and business is growing and they've added a, you know, second or third crew and things are getting stressful because they can't really relay that vision clearly to the, to the foreman or to the team that are, that are behind them. And, you know, I, I know for sure you you've done that very well in your career. And, and what, what kind of advice would you say you could give a smaller uh, business or a smaller company um, when it comes to kind of motivating the team 
and, and making sure they understand your vision. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, there, there's lots of things you, you put out there. One, one word that kind of always triggers me is the word motivation. So, um, when people use the word motivation, it, it, you know, it conjures up into me kind of more of a, a situation where you're, you're maybe whipping your team. Um, so, you know, a coach that would motivate somebody, let's say before a hockey game or a football game, you know, is in the dressing room and they give the big speech and they're yelling. Um, and motivation will take you a certain distance. Um, and when you're, when you're, when you're a smaller operator you have less crews or less people, you, you can use motivation a little bit more because you have more direct contact with everybody in the organization. So you can, I guess, motivation, you can almost, you can, it's a little bit more lead by example sometimes. So you can, you can get out there and like, this is how you plow and this is how you cut grass and come on, we can do this team and this constant prodding and prodding. And then as the organization grows, um, you need to, you need to transition from being a motivator to being an, an inspirer. And ins- inspiration is a really powerful tool. If you can get your head around it in that, you know, uh, all right, so it's inspiring would be more where, you know, the company just starts to follow the direction and the vision of a leader. And that and that comes through just, you know, feeling confident about what you're doing, uh, having a track record of success, and also becoming more of a mentor and a teacher as opposed to a, a more of a captain of the ship. So uh, you'll see good leaders as they get as they start to age, they kind of fade a little bit into the background and their success is more about how is my team doing or, you know, how did, you know, one of your head sales guys land a big deal without you being involved. And for me now, that's become where I get really excited. I, it's hard to do too, because you start to devalue yourself and like you, you brought up ego. So the ego wants to be the guy that does everything and ego wants to be the man that made everything happen. And, and when do you take the ego and shove it in the closet, be able to sit back and go, my success now is judged by others' success. And this is a, this is a kind of a, a change that, that you have to go through and you have to embrace if you want to move past being caught at a certain part or a certain level of, of running an organization. So as you, there's a book out there called Navigating the Growth Curve, and it talks about businesses and it's all, all the complexities driven by the number of of employees, number of team members. And if, and if you read the book, you'll see that, you know, a lot of guys, when they start a company, they're either the president or the CEO, but they only have four people, right? And it, and now you're a CEO wearing all kinds of hats. Well, the CEO of a 500 person company has to have a completely different set of skills than a CEO of a 10 person company. So again, you need, you need to understand as the business grows, you know, how to evolve and change. And, and you'll feel it in your stomach because it's usually an awkward feeling. It's like, hey, I always thought I was a 32 jean, but actually you're not. You're a 36 now and you're still trying to wear the, the tight jeans. It'll feel uncomfortable. And that's a call to, to look at yourself and your leadership style and maybe look at uh, coming up with a change and how you're doing things. Yeah, that's that's great advice. Um, and, you know, along the same um, line, I guess, as your business grew, you had to have um, felt that pinch many times. And I'm sure, um, you know, you had to, to look outside of the organization over the years to um, find the right people. I mean, uh, you know, I know myself, I'm a huge um, proponent of, of promoting from within, but there are times when, when you just need these skills from outside of the organization. And, and I guess, you know, over the years when you found yourself in that position, looking outside, um, how do you find great people? I, I, I know your company's full of them. I've, I've gotten to know um, some of your staff and the, and the leadership team and certainly, uh, you know, you've got some incredible people there. How did you find those people? Um, because, you know, I think that's a question that contractors always have as they start to, to grow the company and they identify their own weaknesses or the weaknesses of their team. 
and, and they find themselves looking for, for, for the right person. Yeah, I think, you know, for me, it, I really, really am a big proponent of trying to find people within the organization that you can promote and that you can help grow. So from a very early age, uh, when I started the company, I actually went to the Haskane School of Business at University of Calgary, but I was also on a full ride hockey scholarship. So I was pretty connected with um, Hockey Canada's program was was based out of Calgary at the time. I was playing at University of Calgary right around, you know, 87 through 90 and got to go through, you know, obviously the Winter Olympics were in Calgary in 88. So it was crazy because I was playing hockey against as all these Olympic teams were coming in, I was playing hockey against, uh, you know, all these different Olympic teams because they used us as their guinea pigs to get ready for the Olympics. So uh, through that, you know, I got strong connections with, uh, you know, different people in Calgary and, and we used kind of that hockey network for, to get staff. So at one time, and I think it was probably in around 1990, I think we had around 55 uh, people working for us, both male and female, that were top level hockey players. So we had a lot of the women from the Canadian Olympic team working at, at ULS. And if they cut grass, they got to skip the cardio part of the, uh, of their training because we didn't even have ride on mowers back in back then we would cut huge parks with like five people running with 21 inch push mowers all kind of staggered. And, uh, you know, so we got all these great people like, you know, at the company working and then, what would happen is they would work there while they were playing hockey and a lot of them playing down in the States NCAA and they would come back. Jason Smith from the Oilers uh, actually signed his contract uh, with New Jersey Devils at the time when he was working for us. So it was all this stuff was going on and all these great people. So, you know, as that happened, I, I, I got lucky and I, I latched onto a few of them that weren't good enough to play in the NHL, but were, were, were really good people. And, you know, they, they went off and when they finished their, their university degrees, I just said, Hey guys, do you want to work here? And they're like, they were going to school, you know, with the thought of going on and having a career and, but they're having so much fun. And at that time we started that like kind of supervisor and manager position. So I kind of grabbed all those people. And then as the company grew, I got really good at going, you know, this person's different, you know, and it might've been not necessarily business, but they saw the world differently or they carried themselves differently or they acted different around clients. And I just gravitated and I just kept trying to keep those people around to the point where if they wanted to further their school, we would, uh, we would pay for that and we would sponsor them to stay at ULS and continue to develop as a person. And I did feel a lot of pressure though, to give these people opportunity. And some of that, it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy I'm investing in them to grow and they're investing back into me to help ULS grow. And that's why we grew so rapidly and, and got to the, the size we did so quickly because, you know, I was, I was harboring all these great people while well, I needed to have a pool big enough to have them all go swimming with me. So we just decided we're just going to, we're going to keep developing people and keep developing opportunity with our own, within our own company. And now it's like, it's such an infectious thing at our company, how we treat people and how we want people to grow that, you know, we get a good person in there. They want to stay and they, and they want to become a better person. They want to learn. They want to, you know, whether it's business management or, or just being the best deliverer of landscape maintenance services, the, the opportunity is there. So they just don't leave. Um, so all of my, you know, let's say the top 40 people in our company, most of them have been with me for at least 15 years. Um, my two managing directors are now kind of on that, you know, 25 years they've been working for me. And uh, it's just been wonderful because it, even though we have such a big company, uh, we still have that great feeling of friendship and there's lots of, we have a lot of fun at work. So that's kind of nice too. Yeah, wow, that's a that's a really cool story, and I mean, I, I I can completely see how taking high performance athletes and turning them into high performance um, business people makes total sense because they've got that um, natural urge to be great, and 
um, if you can, um, you know, catch their interest, then they're, they're already, they've already got the self-discipline and, and sort of the, the need to, to, to do better, um, sort of baked into their, their, um, personality. So that's a pretty cool story. Um, turning, uh, turning great hockey players into uh, great landscape, uh, uh, managers. That's cool. Um, yeah, that, that story about pushing all the lawnmowers in the park is, is a good one too, there, by the way, <laughs> I got a kick out of that. Um, so, you know, um, something super interesting that, um, has happened in your company over, you know, recent, uh, days is, uh, the decision to take on an equity partner as, as part of your, um, expansion plans, maybe, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? It's 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 not that common in the landscape business, and you know certainly there's a, a never ending discussion around how to you know either sell a company or um, you know create a succession plan for a company. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about the experience of taking on uh, private equity and and you know what that has looked like and, you know, even maybe kind of the, the good, the bad and the ugly, uh, <laughs> of, of, of going through that type of a transition, because, you know, I know it's a, it's a very, um, unusual thing for, for, for a, a landscape contractor to have to deal with. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it's, uh, it is, it's, it's, it's exciting and, uh, kind of, uh, at the start of the dating process, I guess you'd say, because uh, I was approached in April of uh, basically 2019. Um, and then we, we as a group at our company decided to take on a private equity partner and the deal was signed on October 1st of, of 2019. So we're just coming up uh, to the first year. Uh, so September 30th will be off the first kind of full year. Uh, under the new partnership and, and the goals and objectives we're trying to do. Um, but for me, you know, personally, as a business owner, it, it was all, it was such a weird feeling because I was very stressed at the time when I got approached, uh, you know, we had made this transition and, and funds were tight and you know, there's lots going on. I had these other two companies, Spectrum, and I also have a small real estate company I was doing. And, you know, my biggest concern was, uh, you know, what happens if Steve gets tired out and what happens if Steve and my energy, you know, as I get older, um, the energy levels start to fall. Right. Um, you know, if I was playing hockey, my shifts would probably be down to 10 seconds now, but, uh, uh I give a great 10 seconds though, Mark, I still can give it, but, uh, you know, it, I got to that point where I, it, I had, a, I was worried for me and my wife and how, how was it going to get out of all this stuff? I mean, like we were millions and millions of dollars of equipment, like, our fleet right you know at the time was probably 132 trucks and and then with ex of excavation equipment and larger riding mowers it, it's like six or seven hundred pieces of equipment so how is this all going to work you know and uh as with the rapid growth it was great like people would come and say wow you got a company you know and it, it, it you must be doing really good well we i was doing good but, uh, you know, the shoemaker's children have no shoes, right? That's the saying because at the end of the day, your most valuable commodity is time, whether that's with your kids or your wife or your friends or doing things you want to do. And so all the stuff weighed on me, but I also had this overriding guilt of you know, how do I make sure that people that are working here and giving me their life uh, don't all of a sudden I walk off. I walk out of the arena and then the game stops. So for me, that was a big thing. So I went to my two kind of uh, right-hand men, left and right-hand guys and said, what do you guys want to do? Here, Here's the opportunity. And I need you guys to make a decision whether you want to take on a private equity partner, you want to keep going ahead. And they're like, Steve, this isn't our decision. I said, yeah, it is your decision. Because if I decide to do the private equity uh, deal and you guys don't want to be around here, then I don't want to do it. And I think they were kind of honored to be left with that decision. But, uh, you know, and, and I obviously had some, I was throwing some, uh, some points into the pot, but at the end of the day, we decided for the company, it was the best thing to do at the time. So we, so we marched forward and, uh, 
and we, you know, we're going full speed in that direction. So, um, ULS, it's funny because we, they've kind of rebranded and renamed us. So the new company is actually called Urban Life Solutions, but we're keeping all the all the branding and the logos and everything of ULS. They really like that. Um, so, but but the the actual incorporated company is called Urban Life Solutions, and we're going to focus mostly on delivering you know municipal, government, and large portfolio holder services, and. And so far, like, you know, you talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly. It, it definitely is a shift, you know. Um, I joke around and I always say to people and my friends, I'm working for the man now, right? Um, uh, I've got a really good situation in that they, they have a high level of trust in our team. So they've, they've given us quite a long leash to, to operate how we see fit. Um, obviously, the weird twist, I don't know if you heard, Mark, but part of the, the uh, stuff that we inherited is they – is that the private equity company also owned the largest towing tow truck operation in Alberta. So that, that was part of this delivery to municipalities. So we were supposed to merge with them and the management team there was kind of supposed to be in a way our bosses and, uh, but it didn't work out that way. So we actually ended up kind of uh, cannibalizing the towing company. So now not only is ULS delivering, you know, uh, lawn maintenance and and property maintenance and stone ice management services but we also have like 100 tow trucks now so um this has caused us to to increase the calgary head office and this kind of stuff so uh it's a whole different feeling uh as far as like the ability to access capital and be able to grow um they're very growth uh, oriented so the the worry about trying to go to the bank and ask for money or you know scratch together a couple million dollars for some trucks that that's not the issue now it's you know how do you how do you build a team and how do you become the I guess the largest uh, landscape maintenance outdoor service provider in Canada? It's an exciting thing and uh, you know something that was going to happen in Canada and uh, you know I'm happy to be I guess one of the f- first few to to give it a whirl. I guess in the next four or five years we'll see if if uh, Steve takes a cross check to the teeth or if I get to hold the Stanley Cup above my head. <laughs> yeah, that's great. No, I love that. Um, no, and and you know, Steve, uh, you know, I, I've gotten to know you over the past uh, number of years, and and you know, your your positivity and and your attitude toward uh, running a business is 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 very uncommon, and and I think you know, it's definitely what is needed to take. Um, uh, you know, a run at consolidating the industry in Canada because it, it really hasn't been um, done and, and there is some opportunity there for sure. And uh, and the, the fact that you've, uh, you know, quickly moved into uh, three provinces in, in such a short period of time uh, is, uh, is definitely, um, you know, some proof behind the, the concept. So congratulations on, on all the all the changes to date and, and it'll be exciting to, to see what, uh, what happens next. And I'm sure it'll be the, the Stanley cup moment, not the, not the cross check. <laughs> so, um, but, but thanks <laughs> for joining see. us today. <laughs> I, uh, I really appreciate you taking the time and, and, and sharing your story and, and kind of introducing yourself to the audience. And, and we're going to definitely have, um, uh, you on more often. And, uh, I definitely want to kind of uncover some of the, uh, secret sauce. I'm going to, I'm going to pick at you, <laughs> um, and understand really how, um, you, you've been able to, to, to grow such a successful company in, in the operational side of things. So I want to, want to pick your brain on, on things like, you know, snow plowing and creating, uh, teams and, you know, sales and, and all kinds of different topics, because I think you've got a lot to share and, uh, and, um, and I know you're, you're of that mind of, of seeing that firsthand with, with you, you know, developing the, the Western Canada snow and ice show. I mean, you're, you're really inviting your, your competitors in many ways to come and, and, and learn your, uh, your tricks of the trade, so to speak. And, and I know, uh, you know, I've heard many stories about you um, taking equipment from your equipment supply 
that you know should have maybe gone to your own company uh, and you've you've placed it with with customers. You're you know such a sort of customer focused uh, um, business owner. I, I think that's super interesting as well. So I'd love to love to hear more um, along that that line as well. Just how you uh, create the customer experience that you have, because I think that's a big piece of of why you've been so successful. And, and we didn't really talk about that today. So looking forward to, to future conversations for sure. Yeah, no, I really appreciate you having me on. And uh, I've always said to people, uh, you know, if you, if you treat people good, it always comes back twofold. And the one thing about, you know, the landscape, I mean, the lands, when you talk about landscape, industry in Canada, I mean, that's fragmented into all kinds of micro businesses and different things. And um, I think at the end of the day, when you look at the size of the market and the amount of work out there, there's lots and lots of rooms for great companies, um, whether that's, you know, a small contractor that's, you know, working in Peterborough, Ontario, or somebody that's trying to to have kind of a national presence. I think there's room for everybody. And uh the cream always rises and uh, that'll continue to happen. There's nobody that'll ever be able to do all the work that's out there. And uh, so you just need to do what you're doing and do it well and uh, success will follow thereafter. Yeah, that's great advice to wrap up. So thanks again, Steve. Uh, we'll talk to you again um, soon. Thanks a lot, Mark. All right. Thanks, guys, for tuning in today. And make sure you come back next week. We've got more expert landscape business advice coming down the pipeline. Once again, a huge shout out to LMN Software for sponsoring this podcast and making this all happen. LMN is the most comprehensive landscape business management software in the industry. It's the true do-it-all tool for your landscape business and provides a platform to scale your company to the next level. And the best part about LMN is they have a free version which you can begin using today. Just visit golmn.com backslash disruptors. You guys can start taking advantage of the software that I've been using to help me create a successful, sustainable, and profitable company. That's golmn.com backslash disruptors. Thanks again, everyone, and see you next week.